So without further ado, it is an absolute honor. I cannot tell you what an honor it is to bring up our, our speaker for this morning. So American artist Chaz Fagan grew up in Belgium and in rural Pennsylvania, gathering inspiration from the rich landscape and history of his surroundings. A self-taught artist, Chaz graduated from Yale University with a degree in Soviet studies. In 2002, he and his wife Katie decided to raise their three children in Charlotte, and they immediately fell in love with the city, the people, and the history of the Queen City. Chaz is proud to have had the chance to capture some of that history and unique character in the bronze sculptures of Thomas Spratt and King Hagler and of the horse riding Captain Jack on Charlotte's Greenway. Ladies and gentlemen, here to speak to us on our global theme of commitment, please welcome the remarkably talented Charlotte's own Chaz Fagan, everybody. Come on up, Chaz. Uh, well, thank you so much for having me. As you can tell, Matt and Tim are pretty much contagious. And uh, you know, when they asked if I'd do something like, hey, would you mind, mind giving a talk? I said, sure. But then like, you know, time goes by and then this, this subject comes and it's commitment in a life of art. And I'm thinking, oh, you know, maybe I'm not the guy who should be up here. Maybe my wife Katie should be up here. <laughs> and I'm serious. And I have two major examples and two memories to share with you. The second one I'll share at the end. This first one is still crisp in my brain. Uh, it's a long time ago, but uh, Katie is looking at me with that look. We're on our way to being married, and she has the big question. So what happens when this whole art thing doesn't work out? <laughs> I'm processing. I'm looking at her. She's looking back at me, and I still have no answer whatsoever because I had no plan B. Silence. That minute was the longest minute of my entire life. At the end of it, though, she still went with me. She went with it. And, you know, and she was an econ major, so she should have just known better. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm talking about in terms of just commitment, an actual like, conscious commitment to art. She did it. And as you heard, um, she, she really had to ask me that question because my degree was in Soviet studies. And I was heading to DC. I was going to do foreign service. I did Middlebury language immersion programs. I, did, uh, I went to the Soviet Union and studied there at Leningrad State University. When I got back to the US, I happily went to Katie and said, you know what? I want to become a cartoonist. <laughs> There's no turning back at that point. I am going to do this art thing. And I need to become a cartoonist. So how do you do that? I had no idea, no clue. Um, the only thing I did know is this one phrase that was bouncing through my head, thanks to my grandmother, it sounds silly, but it's always been there and I live by it. It's, you jump in with both feet. And I'm telling you, my grandmother, as a little kid, I was building a dam in our stream at the farm, and suddenly she jumps in and says, whatever you do, you gotta jump in with both feet. I live by that. So, cartooning with both feet, what do you do? <laughs> I, had, I had no idea, but I figured, it's a newspaper, right? You gotta find a newspaper that needs a cartoonist. Well, I can tell you that in 1988, uh, there were zero. Uh, no openings in the entire country. But as you know, I had no plan B. So this was going to work. So I ended up traveling around, I met with editors, and I set up a, a, arrangements with them where I would send them cartoons, and if they used them, they would pay me. And for that, I mean, that's like uh, you know, a little self-syndication gig. And it worked. I mean, I didn't reinvent the wheel or anything, but it, it worked. Didn't pay well, worked. But then I got very lucky, and I was published in some big newspapers all at the same time, and I got noticed. And suddenly I was picked up by a syndicate. So for all the creative people out there, this was absolute heaven. I had the job, but I had no boss, and I had no editor. And these were cartoons. All I had was a deadline, so I became very, very familiar with the whole concept of deadline. I went back and dug up some old cartoons, and here you go. These are from 25 years ago. Recognizable people, you got Bush and Perot and Clinton, it's a presidential election, and as you go through, these themes just don't go anywhere. Uh, healthcare coverage, anyone? Has that been solved yet? <laughs> Taxes, not going anywhere. <laughs> North Korea, not going anywhere. Granddad, son, grandson, it's all there. And then here, it's proof that, that I was having a ball, but this is something that will never disappear out of DC. This is one political party relishing the political demise or the political scandal of the other. So obviously, I'm having an absolute blast. So totally rewarding, totally fun, just not monetarily rewarding. And on my 
family side, things are starting to happen. I'm married, I'm, kids are on the way, mortgage, etc. You got responsibilities, so what do I do? Just keep moving. Move forward. Add more stuff. I always loved pencil as a kid, so I started these pencil drawings. And then they were published in magazines, and I started to do this kind of stuff, and got known for doing kind of classic pencil portraits. Scratchboard. This is a Vietnam wall. Uh, Scratchboard is where you scratch with a razor blade and you reveal the white clay underneath, and it gives like a totally cool uh, effect. It's like uh, like sculpting in 2D. So totally contagious. Great for someone like me. Magazine covers. Who could say no to that? <laughs> I get to paint, and it's rich stuff, and it's Ross Perot dressed up like Napoleon, and he's crowning himself. I'm in. <laughs> and. That's what happened is the editors figured out that this guy is such a sucker for history. We'll just dangle something in front of him. He'll say, yes. Well, you say yes for the editors. And what happens is they say, great. The driver will be there tomorrow morning at 6.30 to pick it up. Click. That was the fun, though. That was the rush. That you're, you know, you're creating this, this world of stuff. And indeed, uh, I lived in Philadelphia at the time. So they would drive in from New York, pick it up, and take it back all wet. Terrifying for the artist, but still, it worked. Again, same old thing. Quick work overnight, you do it, but the catch with this is you never know where things lead. So this is just a standard magazine cover portrait, President Reagan, yes, I'm in. So I take it, I do it, and then the, the day it hits the newsstand, I get phone calls from members of his cabinet asking if I would do a legitimate portrait of President Reagan for a place in New York. And that opened a whole new world. Now, wait, 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 I can do portraits too. This is fun, so I'm branching. I'm still moving in all directions, so I'm playing portraits, uh, classic kind of portraits with families, uh, cool lighting, retro style stuff, loving it. Not necessarily a portrait, but it could be. <laughs> you know, I, I did live on a farm and grew up on a farm, so you know, we knew them personally. I, I was asked by galleries to do landscapes, and I ended up uh, just enjoying it and painting what I liked and you know, these pastoral scenes. So now I'm, I'm into everything, and I'm, I'm doing it all. And it's rich, and it's fun. But now getting back to that whole thing, if you never know what can happen, uh, it's a day like this. I've already had a great day of painting. And then the phone happens, and the, you pick it up, and it's another editor, and he's hoping for an illustration for a magazine. But he needs it immediately. And you know, I have a date night with Katie, and I'm thinking, I can't do this, I can't do this. But then it's a magazine I dealt with a long time, and you know, I'm, I'm both feet in, I'm in. So I'm doing it. I did it. And it was just an illustration of Alexis de Tocqueville. A Frenchman from the 1830s. Very soon after that, uh, the phone rang again, and it was C-SPAN, the TV network. So unbeknownst to me, C-SPAN was planning this year-long program on Alexis de Tocqueville. And they needed visuals. They had no visuals. They needed stuff they could put on TV, they could put on billboards, wrap buses with, everything. And I thought, whoo, this is great. And they, they invited me to DC to pitch. I got the job. The job was to do this portrait of Alexis de Tocqueville stylized in oil in the 1830s style. Awesome. Big break. This was it. And I was so happy for all of three days. Because on that third day, they called again and said, huh, by the way, all the decision makers on that project have changed. And now you've got to come back down to DC and pitch again. And there'll be other guys pitching with you. And so I was confident I could do this. I swung hard before it was going to happen. So I went, and I had all the same bells and whistles, and the script was completely reversed. This time, I was standing dead. It was a silent room, all of them on one side, me on the other, and nothing was happening. And I was dying. It was, I was losing my chance. And my last little piece of paper to toss across the table was a little drawing I had done of Alexis de Tocqueville as like a little bust in that style of the time. And they went crazy. So suddenly, we're standing. I'm out of that room, I'm in another room, I'm signing a contract, I exit the building, and I call Katie. And I say, this is great, it was great, we got it, I, I got it. The catch is that it's no longer a painting they want, me, they want me to do, they want me to do a sculpture. And the catch was, what she knew, is that I hadn't touched clay since the third grade. <laughs> so, so basically, in this you know, highly scientific method, if you just keep jumping with both feet, at some point you're gonna get somewhere. <laughs> and that somewhere might even be into sculpting. There you go, my very first sculpture. Uh, he's only about a foot tall. I went to the local art store and picked up the synthetic clay called Sculpey. <laughs> you know it, yeah. 
and, uh, and I baked it in our oven. <laughs> I sacrificed the lasagna dish. Check another one to Katie. But anyway, now jump forward. Like, I had to do this. The amount of clay I get to play with now <laughs> is, is a lot more than fits in our oven. So that's, that's Captain Jack from here in Charlotte. This is this one for Dallas for just a couple of years ago. There's a detail. So, um, in terms of my personal commitment to art, it's it's like a that's a no-brainer because you know it just comes with me. It's built in. There's nothing I can do about that. It's not a conscious thing. But on the conscious side, what I actively pursue and try to dedicate myself to is the subject of the art and the subject in the art. Basically, that's what art is. It's a, it's a it's a way to convey a story through time. So you're capturing something and presenting it, and hopefully it'll last. And if you think of the earliest drawings possible, you can imagine, uh, uh, you know, like Grog, the uh, the caveman, and he's there busy on working on the wall of his cave. And what he wants to do is immortalize uh, the greatest hunt of the century, you know. And that is what fires him up. It's that that nourishes his whole day, what he's doing, trying to get those animals to look like they're moving. It's everything to him. And that is kind of that, that underpinning of the art, that stuff that's inside it, behind it, that is what drives me. And I've got a few examples. I can show you just uh, where it's, maybe it's not literal or obvious, but it's, it's the stuff behind it. So here's a, here's a portrait of a guy. Uh, not recognizable, not famous, and he, um, so you won't get the story immediately by seeing his face, uh, but he, maybe he's someone we should know, and that's, th that's the idea. So it's the presenting of a person to the viewer, and it turns out this is a guy who's really worth knowing. So uh, I, I had, he contacted me out of the blue. Uh, he's from Seattle, and he asked me to come to his house to paint his portrait, or at least start on it, and the catch was he wanted me to come on a particular day and that day was his family reunion. I had no idea what that meant. And so I said, sure. And I went. And I get there, he greets me at the door, shows me to my room, which is the only guest room in the house. And again, I'm thinking, I'm not family, um, but I'm confused. The party starts. People start coming through that door. And it's, it's like 100 people, 150 people. And they're coming through. And I can tell you from the outside perspective, from mine, a lot of those people were definitely not related. So I'm really confused. Standing there talking to two women, and they realize that I have absolutely no clue, so they help me out, and they tell me a story. The story is of a young couple, recently emigrated from Eastern Bloc country. They speak no English. They're in their car, they're on the side of a mountain, and it breaks down. They're stuck. And out of the blue, this guy arrives, gets a tow truck, helps him fix their car, and it turns out that guy helped him not just that day, but then every day after that. And what he had noticed was in the back seat of that car were two little girls. The two women I was talking to were successful, established doctors. Those two little girls were now the two doctors I was talking to. He had paid for their schooling, tuition, medical school. And it turns out that's what this guy did. He had made his fortune himself out of complete poverty, retired early, and decided that instead of just retiring a life of leisure, he was going to spend the rest of his life just actively helping people. That's all he wanted to do. And all those people coming through the door were just happened to be people that he thought were worthy of some help in some way. Incredible. So maybe not some we know, maybe some we should, or at least emulate. This one is the, the story itself uh, generated this. Uh, I never met, this is Eric Christensen, a Navy SEAL. I didn't know anything about this guy, but I, I was familiar with the story because I read a book. The book was The Lone Survivor by Marcus Luttrell. Um, Mark Wahlberg made a movie about it, and it was, I think it was on TV just this week again. Uh, but um, it's a story of a failed mission in Afghanistan. Four Navy SEALs sent out on a recon mission, and they are ambushed by 400. And that's the main story that everyone knows. But the story they don't know is this guy. This guy was the commander of that SEAL team. So he's back at command, not up in, the, up in the mountains with his guys. And they have communication breakdown. And he finally learns what's happening in the middle of the worst firefight imaginable. And he realizes his guys are in dire straits. And 
at that point, he just jumps up, calls for volunteers, and gets in a helicopter and goes. So no matter what the odds were, he was going to go and fight with his guys. And it's that, that immediate instinct of just selflessness that caught me so seriously that I wanted to make sure it was recorded for good. He ended up uh, flying there. They were roping down to the surface when his helicopter was shot out of the sky, and they all perished. So I did this as a gift for his parents. And I, I would go on, but I'm about to break up here. Um, there's more to this story, and I, I won't share, but the, the main thing about this guy, the more I learned about him, so we think of a Navy SEAL as just a, a big fighter. Well, it turns out that he was teaching English literature at the Naval Academy in Annapolis when his old buddies from the Navy came to him and said, TikTok, buddy, your time's almost up. Your window to become a Navy SEAL is about to close. He took the challenge and became the oldest guy to make it through SEAL training and became a famous Navy SEAL. After his tour in Afghanistan was supposed to finish, he was going to get his master's in Paris because he also spoke fluent French. Story, local story. This is, you, you heard Thomas Spratt and King Hagler. Thomas Spratt on the left is so one of the earliest settlers. And this, so you can tell as a guy, you know, a sculptor, I had a blast. You got, uh, you know, all the details, the feather, the beads, the pipe, uh, all the great stuff, the accoutrements, the shirt, the musket, you know, anything a guy would want to sculpt, it's there. But the main thing here, though, is this pose. It's, it's one guy putting his hand on the shoulder of the next connotes for everyone seeing it, an Im immediate bond, closeness, proximity, all that good stuff. And it turns out that's exactly what happened here. The closest friends, about 30 years apart, but they turned out to be foundational friends, as in they set the stage for the settling of Charlotte. So we kind of owe it to them. But just to, sh to give little anecdotes, like Thomas Spratt paid rent to the Catawbas for his property. Um, as when they were about this time, 1750s, King Hagler came to Thomas Pratt with a little boy. The little boy had been orphaned. Parents had died of smallpox, and King Hagler wanted to make sure this guy was taken care of. Thomas Pratt took him in, made him part of his family, but the main thing, though, he made sure that he kept his name. He wanted to make sure that he didn't forget his history as a Catawba. The, the kid's name was Peter Harris. Jump forward now. This is where the friendships, just a simple rent friendship across cultural bounds can have a ripple effect. 25 years later, they have the American Revolution. And the, the Catawbas here sided with the Patriots, sided with their neighbors against the British Empire. Now, you know, logically, strategically, maybe not the smartest thing to do, but they did it. They went with their neighbors. And famously, there's tons of stories of Catawbas themselves being very active and, and successful in the, in the Revolutionary War. One of those figures who's featured in a Virginia museum in Yorktown is Peter Harris. The little boy grew up and became a famous, at the time, Revolutionary War hero. And uh, the coolest part is I've been to that family plot. Walled in little plot with stones. Uh, to jump back, you're three generations now from this moment. Thomas Spratt's grandson's working in his field and an old man comes out of the woods. Old man is a Catawba, and he says he wants to come home. And it turns out he was dying. He knew it. He wanted to die at home, and he wanted to be buried next to his adopted dad. And sure enough, when you go to that family plot, you have the stones. You've got Thomas Spratt stone, and right next to it is Peter Harris's stone with an incredible epitaph about him being a Revolutionary War hero. Again, friendships that can ripple through time. It's, it's those stories that... Uh, that for me is what art is about, this whole collection of stories. So if you jump back, you know, uh, <laughs> your story world could be just your part of the op-ed page you're allowed to have, and there's our friend Grog, you know? Uh, so it's either that, or it's a landscape that you're just dreaming of stepping into and getting wet. There's uh, the message kind of behind the eyes of the guy looking back at you from the wall. There's a story in there somewhere. Or it's the, uh, the liveliness, kind of the, the quiet energy that's just ready to burst out of this, this completely still clay sculpture. So what gives life to art are those stories that are painted into it and sculpted into them. And that is what I'm totally committed to. And now you know why I'm not wearing a label. 
my name tag because my answer would have been way too long to fit. <laughs> but before I go, there's, there's the, the one, I have to share that second memory, that second story example of commitment. So I, um, it's late at night, I'm up in the studio and then Katie calls me downstairs. And you know, as a dad in the house, you think, oh, kids, what's wrong, what's wrong? Or plumbing, you know, <laughs> something. And so that's what's going through my head. And I run downstairs and I turn the corner and Katie is on the couch. She's on the couch. She's propped comfortably on her knees. Right next to her is a pad of paper. She's at the ready. But in her hands, she's holding her cell phone. And nod to Star Wars. She's, she's brandishing it like a Jedi Knight with a lightsaber. She is ready to rock. And I am completely relieved because it had been 72 hours since the shipping company had informed me that they had lost the Pope. A major and unnamed, still, shipping company had managed to lose my 1,600 pound bronze statue of Pope John Paul II. Now this statue of Pope John Paul was supposed to go to DC and to a museum. And if you remember just a couple years ago, the current Pope was coming to DC, was visiting the United States for the first time, and he was gonna spend a day in DC. And at lunchtime, he was supposed to be in this museum and right next to him in the shadow, he was gonna be in the shadow of this brand new statue of Pope John Paul II. So that is a real deadline. And my statue, unfortunately, was really lost. And you know, in my house, uh, if it's history, ask dad. If it's a mystery, ask mom. <laughs> And she was on it. <laughs> now you know I was relieved. Well, it, it took only about half the night, and she found the Pope. She managed to track down every distribution center in the country. She talked to the night uh, managers of those, who were buddies with another night manager in the next city. And oh, by the way, you better call his cell phone. Here's his number, because he won't answer the other number, et cetera, et cetera. And she found the Pope. So we had a little bit of a window left before the Pope was going to arrive for that lunch. As I left Charlotte, six and a half hours of driving, to think about this, I still didn't know and didn't have confirmation that he was there. But when I pulled into the museum, I turned into that parking lot, and I see this truck. And in the back of the truck, there's the most beautiful wooden crate you've ever seen. <laughs> beautiful. But there's a, the clay version of that statue before it was cast. <laughs> and now here are the, my snapshots of the uncrating, yay, of the statue. Then he's standing, you can kind of see him. There he is, wind blowing, even though he's inside. <laughs> and there he is, waiting for lunch to happen. <laughs> and, uh, and what's fun, though, is I get, I get random emails and texts from strangers and they look, a lot of them look like this. So, so that was his life, is his life, after the lunch. <laughs> but um, so, the, you know, the, so the, the big company had assigned this huge task force, literally they called it a task force, to find my statue. They couldn't, but Katie did. And, and so in, in my version of this art thing, life, uh, my whole family is in it with me. So it's just teamwork, and we all get through it as a team, and there is no I in artist. <laughs> Obviously, painfully, there is uh, one lone, solitary, quirky I in artist, and my daughter sums it up like this. And I have to read this to make sure I get it right. Face, da face it, Dad, you're a recluse. It takes us to make you normal. <laughs> and that is what I call commitment <laughs> in a life of art. Thank you very much. Chaz Fagan, everybody, Chaz Fagan. Next month, our next event is going to be June 1st. We're going to be back at the Fillmore. We're going to be exploring the theme of craft and Beard Award winning baker. Peter Reinhardt is going to be our speaker.